Um, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Wellington health practitioner Gary Moller. I asked Gary to send through a few things about himself, and he sent me through two and a half pages of text. So I've had to uh, pare that down a little. And I know he won't mind me saying this, but if anyone uh, personifies what we're talking about today in terms of natural health, it's Gary Moller. In his 70th year, Gary remains the undefeated back-to-back -back UCI World Masters mountain biking champion, and in addition, he's ranked second in the UCI Masters Cyclo Cross World Championships, which I think was last year, wasn't it, Gary? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Gary is now gearing up to compete in the Ma UCI Masters Mountain Bike Marathon World Championships later this year. So, uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, very good. <laughs> you may have heard of his younger sister, Lorraine. She, uh, she is Gary's philosophy and health management. Lorraine is a four-time marathon Olympian runner and an Olympic bronze medalist. Uh, Gary has been fully immersed in natural health remedies and preventative medicine since 1972, either studying or working in the field. He has three tertiary qualifications in physical education, rehabilitation and sports medicine. So please give a warm welcome for Gary Mollett. Thank you very much, and it's uh, wonderful to see such uh, an amazing turnout uh, for, for this uh, present for this meeting. I'm absolutely taken by it, and uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, my fellow speakers for having the uh, the bravery and uh, to to come and speak to you all. Um, it is also fabulous to see so many people who I have assisted over the years in the audience, uh, probably a third of you, I would say. Uh, so I'm uh, welcome, and it's great to see you all. And I would like to also make a, a special acknowledgement of my partner, Alofa, um, my rock, uh, uh, my encouragement, and also a wonderful example of what uh, natural health can do, the benefits. So I will start, and I'm going to explain why this legislation is so terrible, particularly from a practitioner's point of view. And despite being a mountain biker, I don't want to fall. <laughs> so here we go. In my view, it's a sneaky sandwich. Buy this one, okay? And what they have done is they have uh, sandwiched safe, nourishing, natural products between two forms of uh, technology, which, while they have their place, they have a completely different risk profile. And uh, really, to keep healthy, we need to separate the healthy part of the sandwich from the rest. That's a way of thinking about it. And the thing about it is that I don't heal anybody. People heal themselves. Food is thy medicine. Body, heal thyself. I've never cured a single person in my life. I just simply provide the helping hand, the guidance. That's what my job is. And, um, and it has been that case for thousands of years, since the beginning of time. We cannot ignore that, and we must not lose sight of that. And it begs the question, does any man or woman or agency have the right to own what Mother Nature has gifted us? Uh, what is out there in the universe naturally occurring that has served us and nourishes us since the beginning of time? And uh, yes, uh, they can own the products they make, your pharmaceuticals and so on. They can patent it. But as far as I'm concerned, keep your hands off our natural products and off our food. In addition, our bodies are not commodities. They're not to be owned or to be profited from. And we do not need an army of bureaucrats 
telling us what we can and can't do. Each human per person, everybody, is a miracle. We're a miracle of healing, of nature, and we must not forget that. We're not machines. Okay? You're stardust. You're a child of the universe. The other thing is, is that we must study history. History was my favorite subject at school. And we not only, by not studying history, we don't only risk repeating the mistakes of the past, but also we don't learn the lessons on how we can do better. And now, let's go back a little bit. Now, some of you in the audience are old enough, Winston, I don't know whether you are, you look very young and dapper there, um, to remember the good old days <laughs> when I was a child in the 1950s. And at that time, uh, there was a national crisis. We had a traumatised post-war malnourished population, disease was running rampant, and we had a baby boom. That's me on the, on the, that, that's me there. That's my older sister, Vivian, who used to sneak my bottle at night and drink it. And uh, that's uh, Lorraine, who went on to uh, represent New Zealand many times, um, a 28 year career of international ranking, which I believe is a world record for a running athlete. So how do we do it? The response, uh, to the post-war crisis uh, involved a number of uh, measures, and I want you to take careful note of these. Um, I can remember when the sewerage line came into Potaru, nowadays pronounced Potaru. Thousands of state houses, state-of-the-art houses were built, whole suburbs of them. Boy, could we teach our government a few things about building houses right now, couldn't we, eh? Don't you reckon? Yeah. yeah. And every child received a half pint of milk. I was a milk monitor back then, so I got to drink the leftovers. <laughs> Which explains everything. <laughs> the, um, the t yes, uh, health camps were organized for children the sickly ones, of which there were many. So during the holidays, they went to health camps and uh, they started every day at dawn by going for a run and uh, dipping in the stream or the lake and getting three square meals and help with their education. And that was funded by health stamps. Who can remember health stamps? Now you're showing your age. <laughs> yes, uh, I should point out that the schools were based on the sunshine design built in the, 1960s, in the 1950s. They faced north with uh, broad, broad uh, windows that opened up fully to let in the fresh air and sunshine and the children would sit out in the quadrangle facing north and drink their half pint of milk at morning tea. Hey, okay? absolutely wonderful. And there was a dental clinic in every, every school that I knew of. And uh, my sister, by the way, has been a dental nurse since 1972 in the far north. And uh, unfortunately, she's our, I think, our longest serving dental nurse, but um, despite wanting to go back to work, she's been mandated out and not allowed back. Sadly. Yep, but we have a health crisis, don't we? Yep. yep. And uh, we had a family doctor, very different to today, and your doctor would turn up at two o'clock in the morning to wipe your child's fevered brow or to deliver a baby. But hey, most of uh, the larger towns had a maternity hospital. What an amazing thing they did. So it really was, back then, it was God's own. Putaruru was a tough town to live in. It was, it was pretty rough. Uh, it was covered uh, surrounded by native forests back then. There were seven or eight sawmills operating. Uh, I had to put my dukes up, um, defend my brothers and sisters. But crikey, what a wonderful life we had. Despite the hardship, 
Um, you might have seen, I was barefoot until I went to secondary school. We were poor. The only food we, we had was what mum served up. There were no supermarkets, no fast foods, no nothing. We survived off mum and dad. Now, let's take a look at this photograph. This is the 1970 Potiruru High School athletics team. Now, I want you to take careful note. If you look at these, oh, sorry. Look at these uh, children, these young adults, the men and the women. First of all, look at the muscularity of them. Look at the beautiful alignment of the collarbones of those uh, men in the singlets. And uh, you'll see yours truly up there. Can you recognize him? And yeah, he's the good looking one, by the way. <laughs> yeah, the, way, the one with the hair. And, but what you see here is um, something which I have a book here written by my running mate, Keith, Dr. Keith Livingston. Okay, and it says, champions everywhere. New Zealand produced world champions. Arthur Lydiard, he took a bunch of boys from a suburb in Auckland, and he turned the lot into world champions and Olympians. Peter Snell, Murray Halberg, Bill Bailey, all those. I ran with all of them. <laughs> yep, I uh, assume, yes. <laughs> there are so many. Uh, there were, we were, and when we look at this, every one of these uh, boys and girls here, if they had so chosen and got the right coaching, they all had the talent to be world champions or to represent their country. And um, if we look here, can you spot Lorraine, my sister? Okay, there she is. Now, the girl next to her could beat her. And there are other girls there who could beat her or who were on her tail, okay? What it was, there's nothing freaky about our family. We were just simply raised in God's own back then, and we were fed good food. Um, can you spot one of uh, New Zealand's wealthiest men up there? No? No, he's, uh, he's too young. Yes. I'll give you a clue. He doesn't like cats. <laughs> <laughs> now, if he had decided, he could have changed direction and he could have represented New Zealand. I hope Gareth is listening. I hope somebody tells him that. Um, but the, the point I'm making is that there, there, there is that potential in everyone to excel, so long as it's like growing plants or whatever. You've got to provide the right environment. Today, we've lost the plot. We are now arguably the most unhealthy country in the world for so many measures, particularly of child health. We're, we're certainly number three. You know the worst thing is Australia is doing better than us. And we can't have that, can we? A couple of points. I believe that very few people today die of old age. They die from the combination of malnutrition, environmental toxins, and the side effects of multiple prescription meds. And we've crossed the point where our children are going to have a shorter life and a more miserable life than ourselves. That is uh, the tragedy of what the, we have. And there are no drugs. There are no drugs that are going to fix this. <clears throat> so I've listed some of the things, I'm sure there's a lot more, as to why we have lost the plot so badly. And it certainly began with the introduction of fast food, um, fast food outlets, the invention of the supermarket, and our enthusiastic uh, embracing of it, and uh, the uh, demise of things like the, uh, the working week, uh, the weekend and so on, uh, but also, but really, the direct-to-consumer advertising and um, direct-to-consumer um, uh, direct sales of pharmaceutical medicines and the massive billions of dollars of taxpayer subsidies of medicine, of allopathic and pharmaceutical medicine. I don't receive a cent for what I do. 
uh, have no, there are no subsidies on natural health products and no subsidies on natural health practitioners. Now, if it's good enough for farmers, for the government to remove subsidies from farmers to make them more competitive and more responsive to the market, then let's do that with pharmaceuticals and allopathic medicine. Make them compete against me on an even playing field. Okay? That's what we need. And I like to win. So, New Zealand, our, the report card for New Zealand, the New Zealand health system is basically a complete and utter fail right now. It's totally failing us, and it's ruined by the influence of uh, commercial interests that have no interest in you or me um, from a health perspective, only from what it can extract from your pocket until the day you die. There's no such thing as a healthy person being good for business. I'm bad for business, except for when I fall off my bike, okay? Yeah, there are no drugs to cure what's going on. Um, nevertheless, this is the crazy thing. This is like, I don't know what kind of world I'm living in right now. Um, it's, there's kind of an insanity. Um, it's a complete and utter failure. You just look at where we have gone from the 1960s and 70s to where we are now as a nation, how healthy we are. And they're doubling down. More drugs, more bureaucracy, more restrictions, and kill shots for health professionals like myself, okay? And as was said, no meaningful health advice at all. And in fact, uh, if I give meaningful health advice, as I'll touch on shortly, I'm gonna talk about kill shots in a minute and explain exactly what those kill shots are, okay? Now, this um, is a young woman, a young girl, about 12 years of age. She didn't want to go to school. She was covered head to foot with eczema. There was no medical cure for her. So what did I do? Oh. Um, somebody did a, a person, somebody, <laughs> Somebody who doesn't know much about news, uh, about rugby culture said, isn't that the women's sevens team celebrating? And I, th oh, of course not, uh, but I had to do a second take because the way things are nowadays, uh, it <laughs> probably could be. <laughs> However, however, there's more than seven. <laughs> we went back to basics. What I did was I, I just simply did some simple testing to determine this young girl's nutritional status, uh, nutritional imbalances, any toxins, and then allowed Mother Nature to do her, uh, with me providing some guidance and a little bit of help here and there. That's all I did. And several months later, we have this beautiful, healthy young girl with the most beautiful skin back at school and doing so well, and now she is a healthy adult woman. Okay, this is the power of nature. This is what they want to take away from us. So I'm getting to the kill shots. This is, um, the, the, the bill is about 324 pages. I've read a lot um, and I've dug out, yep, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it takes some time and I've been through, been through it several times trying to figure out what, what it means for me and for others, and for all of you in this room, by the way, and your children. Now, this is what I mean by kill shots. If I make 
an unapproved claim, an unapproved health claim, for example, that maybe zinc and selenium and something else might be beneficial for helping that young girl get over her eczema. If that's not approved by the regulator, that bureaucrat looking over my shoulder in the clinic, then I may be risking a five-year jail term, a $2 million fine, and the confiscation of my assets, possibly my home, because I work from home, and that doesn't include the $200,000 that I'll probably have to spend hiring a lawyer, okay? It's just uh, um, unbelievable. Now, this is just some of them. If you want to just read one, th one section, go to the penalty section, read the penalty sections. Um, sure, if you're a big multinational, you, you might be able to get away with some of these, but not me. If this bill goes through and that legislation is there, I'm not going to be the first to test it. I'm going into retirement. I can't risk this legislation. It's too risky. If I prescribe or if I recommend taking more than 500 milligrams of vitamin C, let's assume that that's the limit that they're going to place on vitamin C. And I say, when you've got a, when you've got a, a flu or a cold, take two 500 milligram vitamin C pills. Am I breaking the law? Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but I'll tell you what, I'm not going to risk it. Because if they prosecute, they're using your money, endless money, I haven't got any. Okay, I've got nothing to spare. So it's a kill shot. It puts me out of business. Yep, it's Bozo the Clown. It's a clown show. Mother Nature doesn't need a middleman. She doesn't need an army of bureaucrats. She doesn't need, we don't need the knowledge of natural therapies to be suppressed. And we don't, I don't need a regulator looking over my shoulder telling me how to run my, run my how, how to do my job, okay? Um, and by putting people in the wrong place, doing things they barely understand, we get chaos. We get an absolute mess. We get a clown show. So bring on Bozo. Do any of you know Bozo from your childhood? So they've lost the plot. Now, here's the thing. If man thinks he can administer the natural world and play God, if this legislation negates the fundamental right of all New Zealanders to make choices and reduces us to mere commodities to be exploited, I say this, if the regulator understands the infinity of the universe and the healing powers of Mother Nature better than God, then let him be. If not, I say this, buzz off, get out of the kitchen and get out of my clinic. <laughs> so what do we do about it? I've been working on this for a long time. And this is the solution. This is the way out. This is how we do it. And we've got the numbers. We've got the people. The first thing we must do is identify and support the political parties that pledge to abolish the Therapeutic Products Bill and commit to a holistic, community-wide health reforms that first and foremost benefit New Zealanders. We need to go back to the past, go back to the 1950s and 60s and learn the lessons of history. We need to unite as a movement to focus our voters precisely to gain the kingmaker role after the next election. And we need to demand the parties with no chance of surpassing 5% or winning the electorate seat that they merge with the leading party that pledges to scrap this legislation. And I want you out here to think of being winners, okay? We're going to win. And by the way, that's my oldest daughter, Myra, and she's a winner. Now, look at the guy behind him, behind Myra. I think he's about to die rather than be passed and beaten by a woman. <laughs> he lost, by the way, but I can report that he did. Okay? <laughs>
I'll finish with um, a quote from my sister Lorraine, who was a true winner, uh, representative of New Zealand, and a true patriot. And we need patriots to look. We need people here to stand up for New Zealand now. And the existence of each of us is testimony to how Mother Nature, in all her wisdom, has managed to sustain life perfectly well on her own for thousands of years without a group of people in a boardroom managing her resources. And I'd like to finish on that note. Thank you very much.